two. Hello everyone, and welcome to today's Drug Discovery News webinar. I am Sejal Davla, Assistant Science Editor for DDN, and I will be moderating our discussion. We have an exciting webinar planned for you today. Our speakers, Dr. Tamara Laskowski and Dr. Mike Liu, will discuss advances that bring chimeric antigen receptor or CAR therapy for solid tumors one step closer to reality. After the talk, Dr. Laskowski and Dr. Liu will participate in a live Q&A session. To submit your questions or comments, simply submit your question to the Q&A portal to the right of your screen. We will try to get to as many of these as possible. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our webinar sponsor, BPS Bioscience. BPS Bioscience INC is a scientist-founded, scientist-driven biotechnology company supporting researchers worldwide. Characterized by its customer-oriented approach and its ability to tailor services to meet specific research requirements, BPS Bioscience is a global provider of compound screening and profiling services, assay development, and recombinant cells. BPS is also a leading manufacturer of over 4,000 recombinant enzymes, cell lines, and assay kits. Our sponsor has provided us with some helpful handouts related to today's discussion. You can find these in our handout section located on the right side of your screen where you can also find your certificate of attendance for participating in today's live event. And with that, let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Tamara Laskowski. Tamara Laskowski received her PhD in human molecular genetics and immunology from the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. She researched targeted genome editing of patient stem cells to correct genetic mutations linked to immune disorders. Laskowski later joined Lawrence Cooper's laboratory at MD Anderson Cancer Center, where she developed stem cell-based platforms for off-the-shelf production of genetically modified natural killer and T cells. Subsequently, Laskowski transitioned to a senior scientist position at the immunotherapy platform led by James Allison and Padmini Sharma, where her work focused on the application of multidimensional analytical approaches for comprehensive immune monitoring of clinical trials. Currently, Laskowski is a scientific product project director in the CAR NK program at MD Anderson Cancer Center. In her role, she supports the development of novel off-the-shelf natural killer cell therapies targeting solid and hematological malignancies and the implementation of a multimodal approach for product characterization and validation. Um, let's just uh, take a minute to make sure um, slides are working. Okay, Dr. Laskowski, please take it away. Thank you very much, Sage, for this very kind introduction. And thank you all at DDN for the invitation to be a part of this event. Very excited to be here. Uh, and as the, you can tell by my title, I'm going to talk about solid tumors. And I'm going to try to give you a better picture than what we have had um, in, in, in sort of the history of uh, oncology. And I'm looking at challenges now as in, in, in the perspective of turning them into opportunities, because I think the field is primed for tackling these more challenging diseases. We have the right tools, the right understanding, and we can maximize and use that to take those challenges, those barriers and those walls, break them down and turn them into opportunities for new therapeutics. So with that, I'd like to get started. And uh, before I initiate into what I'm going to talk about, I want to take you through sort of a very 50,000 foot view, a global view of what these past few decades have meant for people like me and so many of you who are in cell therapy or immuno-oncology or uh, cell, cell therapy or cellular immunotherapy um, space. And you can, you've seen a tremendous amount of development. And of course, CAR T cell therapies have led these developments and have revolutionized the immuno-oncology field. And this slide here basically summarizes the work of the pioneers who have led 
to this tremendous development that we have seen. On the right-hand side, you see the four new products that are now available for clinical use and approved for use in patients. And some of these products, as we've seen tremendous data from Kimraya, for instance, have led to cures to diseases that have been deemed incurable, relapsed refractory disease that had never responded. Patients who had a very grim prognosis have seen tremendous change. Uh, and then on the left-hand side, you see the types of publications that when we go into PubMed, this is what we see now. We see titles that talk about sustained remissions in very challenging disease, refractory relapse to cancers. We see long-term follow-up in patients, patients who have been treated with these diseases and are sustaining remission, sustaining a disease-free status for a very long time. These are unprecedented outcomes that the field has not hadn't seen prior to CAR T cell therapy uh, in, in the space of cellular therapy. So this has, is very encouraging and has fueled uh, scientists and clinicians to look at novel strategies building onto these developments to tackle the more challenging diseases. So however, though the field has shown tremendous potential, there have also been challenges associated with autologous CAR T, the same autologous CAR T that has given these, these unprecedented outcomes in patients. And some of these limitations have to do with the autologous nature of this therapy and the very complex and laborious manufacturing process, as, is it, as it is illustrated here on the, the left-hand side with this um, schematic. And essentially, and if I can summarize what those challenges consist of, in, in most instances, it's the costly, complicated manufacturing process that introduces a lot of delays into generating this therapy for patients. And these delays can be a significant hindrance for patients who come to the CAR T cell uh, uh, clinic, if you will, uh, are eligible for this treatment, but have a, a very rapidly progressing disease. Those patients do not have an extended amount of time to wait for the treatment. And the manufacturing process does require an extended um, time. In terms of patient-to-patient -patient variability, CAR, autologous CAR T cells can represent a, hin a hindrance. A lot of the patients who are candidates for CAR T therapy have also undergone multiple rounds of conventional therapy, re rendering those patients weak, those immune cells oftentimes not suitable uh, for the extensive manufacturing process, either because the cells themselves are not strong enough to endure the process or because there aren't sufficient numbers of cells for going through the manufacturing process. So this hinders the, the, the ability of CAR T cells to actually reach a broad number of patients who could benefit from this therapy. So given the successes that we know we can achieve with the cell therapy, CAR-mediated therapies, but the hindrances that we've seen and learned from the autologous CAR T experience, the field has turned into possible other options for cell therapy, looking at potential allogeneic sources that may lend themselves well to the manufacturing process and turn this into an off-the-shelf drug, a drug that's manufactured ahead of time and available to patients upon need. In my case, my interest has been very heavily focused on T cells and on the allogeneic front has been focused on NK cells. NK cells uh, lend themselves very well for um, allogeneic type of therapies given the fact that NK cells have in early result, uh, results from clinical trials shown no uh, GVHD or very low risk of GVHD or cytokine storm or any other types of cytotoxicities that we have seen associated with CAR T cell treatment. So let's take a, a quick pause and take a look at why these two uh, uh, cells are comparable in their potential and why NK cells do represent a very viable source for immunotherapy or cellular immunotherapy. You're very familiar with T cells from all the CAR T cell experience, and you know the T cells come from the adaptive immune system. These cells can be separated into two major subpopulations your CD4 positive T cells and your CD8 positive T cells. The main difference between those is the CD4 being your helper T cells that uh, uh, permit uh, the recruitment and the immune modulation of, of a potent immune, immune response, and your CD8 T cells being your cytotoxic killer cells that mediate high cytotoxicity against their targets. Now, T cells differentiate in the thymus and do require antigen priming to acquire their effector functions. Therefore, T cells are characterized by the presence of a T cell receptor, a very unique specific receptor present on this cell that is specific for a particular antigen. And though this is highly specialized, a highly specialized function of T cells, 
It is also a function that renders T cells very likely to induce GVHD because they recognize their, their specific antigens in the context of an MHC molecule. That is, your HLA type will matter to T cells. So they can recognize non-self and initiate a response against non-self rendering T cells in a, a source that is difficult to use in an allogeneic setting. And K cells, on the other hand, belong to the innate immune system. These are cells that are with you early on in life. These cells do not possess a CD3 uh, TCR or a T cell receptor. They differentiate in the bone marrow and do not require antigen priming. These cells are unlicensed killers, if you will. They do not kill based, uh, a target based upon the recognition of a single antigen. Instead, as my cartoon here illustrates, in K cells interact with the, their targets through a, a, an array of receptors. Some receptors will give in K cells a negative signal, other receptors will give in K cells a positive signal. If the sum of those signals goes towards positive signal and K cells elicit their killing function and eliminate the target. If the sum goes towards negative signals, those are inhibitory signals, in case cells stop and do not kill the target. So in case cells are very fast responders when they approach a target. But because of uh, the, uh, the, the lack of recognition to HLA and this independence from HLA guided recognition of their antigens, uh, and case cells represent uh, or present a very low risk of GVHD, making them a very viable and suitable source for allogeneic cell therapies. Uh, in addition to these uh, favorable biological properties, and K cells also have incredibly potent responses when they achieve or uh, 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 the recognition of a target. And K cells are highly cytotoxic, just like CD8 T cells. They exhibit natural antiviral and anti-tumor responses, and they kill their targets, as I've mentioned to you, in an HLA-independent manner. And as this little cartoon here illustrates to you, and K cells possess various ways of targeting and killing uh, an offender cell, such as a tumor cell or a viral infected cell. They can do so by releasing cytotoxic granules or cytokines that have cytotoxic potential, or by engaging with antibodies to then mediate an antibody-mediated cell death of their targets. And much like T cells and K cells can be genetically modified to express a car so that they can be endowed with yet an additional weapon against the tumor. And a car can then guide the NK cell, redirect the NK cell function towards a specific antigen on a tumor cell, much, much like it is done with T cells. And uh, like T cells, there are many protocols available, have been created and established for expansion in genetic engineering of NK cells in a laboratory. So this is a viable approach for cell therapy. We have, of course, at MD Anderson have done that. And within uh, my group, we have been able to, to, to show that this is in fact a very viable approach. In a publication that uh, uh, we released in 2017 in leukemia, we show that in case cells endowed with a car targeting CD19, and this is the schematic of what the car looks like, and this car armored with IL-15 to support the growth and proliferation of in case cells, was able to eradicate lymphoma, a very uh, uh, resistant lymphoma in a mouse model. So here we're looking at Raji as our resistant lymphoma model in, in animals that were treated with only in case cells by themselves, in case cells with CD19 targeting CAR, or in case cells targeting CD19 through CAR endowed with an additional uh, uh, factor here being the IL-15 that supported the growth and proliferation of NK cells. And you can see the difference by just looking at the, the different groups of animals treated that by day 14, both the NKs alone, as well as the untreated controls, uh, uh, relapsed with disease. Whereas by day, uh, the uh, CD19 CAR IL-15 was able to control growth until the end point of, these, of this study at day 28 with all animals still alive and essentially free of tumor burden. We've seen tremendous uh, 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 results with this, uh, this, this car endowed with IL-15, this car in case cell, and then moved to this concept to a clinical study in which these in case cells were then manufactured uh, under current GMP uh, uh, guidelines and were, a product is then generated as it is specified here and, and outlined in this schematic. And within about 15 days of manufacturing, 
in K cells are infused into patients. And what we see here is that we published these results, our preliminary results uh, last year in New England Journal of Medicine, showing uh, uh, the, the outcome of our phase one two clinical trial in our first cohort of 11 patients. 73% of the patients treated with current K cells achieved an objective response in this study, with the majority of patients actually reaching a complete response. There was no evidence of GVHD as we anticipated within K cells. There were no uh, cytotoxicities, no cytokine release syndrome uh, signs in these patients, and the current K cells persisted within these patients for up to a year uh, um, during follow-up. So we're very encouraged by these data. This clinical trial is still ongoing, and we have many more patients that we're hoping to publish an update on in the next year. Uh, but is this sufficient? And when we look at this picture here that was released, um, this is the most updated compilation of data by uh, Nature Reviews Drug Discovery, looking at a broad, taking a broad view of all the top targets and the therapies that we have in terms of active therapies for both hematological malignancies, as outlined here on the left-hand side, and solid tumors, as you can see here on the right-hand side. You can see that much like our NK cells, many other approaches have been successful in their active therapies and development in the hematological space. You see that that scale on the x-axis here reaches about 250. And CD19, much like we did for, for current K cells, is still our leading target in most of these therapies. But conversely, when we look at solid tumors, the picture is very different. It, it, it looks, as the, the picture is kind of deceiving because the, the graphs look similar, but if you look at the, the x-axis, we're only reaching under a quarter of the number that we see for hematological malignancies. And CAR T cells or CAR mediated therapies are not your leading therapy in solid tumors. And there's a reason for that. There are many complexities that exist within this space that are challenges we did not have in this space. So how can we look at what we've learned and take that to the next level to tackling these very challenging diseases? So on this schematic here, I think is a pictorial illustration of why these challenges are so important and why we have to sit down and rethink strategies that can be then employed to the treatment of solid tumors. On the left-hand side here, you see a schematic illustrating hematological cancer. And there are a number of challenges associated with treating these diseases. But one factor that is very different is that the immune cells or the immune cells they are in close contact with the tumor. It's, they have easy access to targeting tumor cells because they inhabit in the same spaces. They benefit from cytokines. They benefit from that environment. Now, when you look at the solid tumor microenvironment, that is an entirely different structure. You cannot ignore the fact that there is a complex architecture that's part of this, this entity. The barriers that are created by the solid mass of tumor cells that then evolve, that, that are different, heterogeneous, that recruit other cells that then add to the inhospitable qual uh, uh, quality of this environment. When the immune system reaches this environment, it is an, a, a difficult barrier to penetrate through. So that's the first challenge. Can cells even get into a solid tumor? And when they get into that solid tumor, what other cell subsets will they interact with? What will those interactions look like? And as you can see, there are many MDSCs, myeloid-derived suppressor cells, T-regulatory cells, stromal cells, tumor-associated macrophages, tumor-associated fibroblasts are all types of cells that negatively regulate the immune system and change what the immune cell intends to do. So you may develop a therapy that has full potential for eradicating a tumor cell, but it arrives in this environment and it is reprogrammed. It is transformed and it no longer exerts the functions that it once was designed to exert. So we have to keep in mind that cell therapies are very different from our conventional drug therapies. These are living drugs, drugs that will interact with their environment and therefore are subjected to changes due to those interactions. So it is imperative that we understand what those changes are, what could impact the success of our therapies. And of course, a big question with when solid tumors is how will we make our cells traffic 
into the tumor, travel to the sites of primary tumor and metastatic sites as well. So the complexities are greater with solid tumors, and that is probably why the graph only shows a quarter of the developments that we see for hematological malignancies. Now, how do we tackle these problems? Is this something that we cannot uh, tackle or deal with? The way we look at it is, no, these challenges in today's world have actually turned into opportunities because we have, we're equipped with the right tools to probe the tumors, to understand what the solid tumor is made of, to understand the different compartments that make up this highly inhospitable environment and figure out ways to devise novel strategies to equip our immune cells with the capabilities of overcoming these challenges. So as this schematic here looks at, uh, illustrates, this is essentially the rationale behind this idea. We can take in case cells and likewise uh, other types of cells, macrophages, for instance. Uh, these can be infused into patients. We can understand what's happening with these patients once the therapy uh, is, is, is actively uh, performing its job or, or interacting with the tumor in vivo. We can harvest these cells and we can interrogate both the tumor cells and the immune cells, understand the evolution of our therapy in the context of this contact and interaction of, with the tumor. We now have many high level next generation tools at our disposal to interrogate the cells at the single cell level and truly understand the heterogeneity in response, the heterogeneity in changes and how cells evolve over time. And so this schematic here just illustrates some of the approaches that we are employing to interrogating these changes. CYTOF, high parameter protein investigation, single cell RNA-seq, looking at the transcriptome at the single cell level, looking at epigenetics and uh, changes within the epigenome in, in these cells through single cell ataxic and understanding the complexities that exist when immune cells encounter a solid tumor. Now with that, we, our rationale, our hypothesis is that we're going to learn novel leads that will then give us opportunities to, un to, to tackle uh, these difficulties within solid tumors. So I'll, I'll illustrate that with an example in the next few slides of what uh, a publication that we released recently looking at tackling the, the problem of glioblastoma multiform. Glioblastoma is one of the most aggressive primary brain tumors in adults, has very poor prognosis for most patients, rapidly grows. There's tremendous heterogeneity within the tumor. The invasion of critical brain structure is a problem that will lead to rapid decline in the patient's health. And there are very few options for patients who are diagnosed with this terrible disease. Now we have looked at this and probed and understood what the tumor cells look like in, the, in, in glioblastoma and what the immune cells that infiltrate glioblastoma look like. Are immune cells capable of infiltrating this tumor? And if so, what stops these cells from killing the tumor? They come in with an intent, but they do not accomplish that function. What are the hindrances? What are the obstacles? And so those questions have led to our, our study that we recently published in which we identify that through mass cytometry that in case cells do infiltrate the glioblastoma tumor microenvironment. But once they arrive in the TME, these cells become dysfunctional. It goes back to what I told you that cells interact with cell subsets that are present in the tumor microenvironment. And of course, are um, uh, uh, um, subjected to changes due to the cytokine and the, the, the milieu that's present in the TME. And in, in this case, I'll just summarize this, this complex heat map here to show you that in case cells that invaded the GBM microenvironment had a reduction in their natural cytotoxicity receptors. These are receptors that we know, such as NKG2D, NKP30, NKP46, and so forth, that are activating in case cells, giving case cells those positive signals that they need to elicit their effector killer cell functions. Additionally, because the, their receptors are uh, lowly expressed, that led to dysfunction and case cells did not any longer produce the same level of cytotoxic granules in response to the tumor. And in case cells exhibited reduction in maturation markers, showing that in case cells did not mature to acquire those effector functions that are necessary to eliminate the tumor. So we see that when case cells come ready for the battle, ready for the fight, they are overcome by the incredibly inhospitable forces that are present in the TME. Now we then probed into that further to understand what exactly was happening 
And so we looked at uh, uh, the production of these cytotoxic granules and cytotoxic cytokines and saw that in, in functional studies that, that, that indeed validated that tumor infiltrating in case cells had decreased potency. So what you're looking at here is a, a, a percent killing of a cell line, K562, is a erythroleukemia cell line that's very sensitive to NK killing. And when you look at the tumor infiltrating in K cells, you can see a dramatic reduction in their tumor killing abilities as compared to peripheral blood in K cells and normal uh, in K cells. And likewise, when we look at uh, cytotoxic, uh, production of, of cytotoxic granules or release of those granules is marked by CD1078. There's a decrease in that in tumor infiltrating in K cells here in the red group. And likewise, those cytotoxic cytokines introduced to you earlier are very much decreased in comparison with NK cells that have not infiltrated the tumor. So we see a tremendous difference in the NK cell performance and in its potency when it enters into this very inhospitable, very hard to, 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 to thrive in environment. Consistent with our hypothesis that the TME will modulate to the function of NK cells. So we sought to understand why that was the case. What were the drivers of this dysfunction in NK cells? And again, equipped with this next generation of tools that we have at our disposal, we now then looked at single cell transcriptome profiling to better understand why tumor infiltrating NK cells were so different from their counterparts, your normal PBMC NK cells. And so what we're looking at here is, is that overall, we, we observed an overall loss of potency highlighted here by, as you can see here in the TINK group, a reduction in NCR, natural cytotoxicity receptors, granzyme A, granzyme B, granzyme K. These are your granzymes uh, uh, that, that are part of your cytotoxic granules. In addition to CD16, the ability of NK cells to, to potentiate their function through a GCC. And furthermore, we identified pathways that were very relevant, pathways that were the tumor's way of shutting down the NK response. And TGF beta pathway came up as a very significant change and that induced this, dis or likely inducing this dysfunction in NK cells. So we interrogated TGF beta pathway. Could this be the reason why our NK cells are encountering, uh, 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 you know, could this be the barrier they're encountering that is leading to this dysfunction? So we then went back to uh, looking at the TGF beta pathway in the G GBM uh, stem cells, your GSCs, as illustrated here in this schematic, and eliminated through genetic engineering or uh, through CRISPR, the receptors that would respond to TGF beta on NK cells, th thereby blocking the ability of the GSCs or glioblastoma stem cells to elicit this negative uh, a signal through the TGF beta pathway. And what we saw is indeed that that yielded tremendous response. And here, uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to just go over these groups quickly with you. This is the GSC alone. As you see, the tumor untreated continues to grow and, and, and expand. In case cells are able to keep the tumor at bay for a short time, in case cells uh, treated with the uh, TGF beta inhibitor are able to to keep the tumor at bay, but not all animals uh, thrive over time. But when we add the TGF beta knockout in K cells, in addition, we can see a, an, an increased response. And we can see that, in fact, that can yield a different response, that TGF beta is indeed uh, one of the, the components leading to dysfunction in K cell in the GBM microenvironment. So what this showed us is that that we are here today where we have a, a few clinical trials looking at solid tumors, a few clinical trials that are exploring novel therapies for solid tumors as compared to what we see for hematological malignancies or your blood indications. Though this is our reality today, the careful study and the use of next generation technologies can turn these challenges into opportunities. We can now look at what these challenges that we have come to know as the hallmarks of cancer, these challenges that are inherently present in solid tumors are no longer just walls we cannot break through, that there are in fact uh, many therapies and many different strategies that have been developed to counter these hallmarks of cancer, these challenges. So this is a very popular uh, diagram by Hanahan and, and, and Weinberg showing uh, the hallmarks of cancer, and it's been adapted to show all the different developments that we have made along the way to counter the number of challenges that we know cancer will pose to both the immune system and to treatment overall. But how, it, when we look here at avoiding immune destruction, this is where 
I reside, this is my space. And uh, many of you who are watching uh, or, or listening in, uh, you this is where you are as well. You're an immune oncology uh, uh, scientist. Your contribution comes from this arm. And there are many opportunities, though the challenges are great. There are many opportunities, as you've seen illustrated here, for understanding what mechanisms are driving this immune evasion process that cancer develops and how we can then counter those mechanisms through careful studies that address the unique challenges presented by each of these uh, tumors, each of these diseases. So with that, I conclude and I thank you all for your time today. Uh, and I think, of course, for studies like this take an entire village <laughs> to support you. And I'm very grateful to have a great team, be a part of a great team uh, and, and a great institution that can really foster the growth and development of novel therapies and potentially bringing new hope to patients. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Laskowski. And for now, um, let me introduce our speaker, a second speaker, Dr. Mike Liu. Mike Liu received a PhD in immunology from the Phillips University in Marburg and worked on the immunomodulatory activity of HDAC and proteasome inhibitors in carcinogenesis. Liu then worked as a postdoctoral associate in, my, in Michael Hudashek's lab in Würzburg to investigate the role of bacterial metabolites on adaptive immunotherapies for cancer. Liu is a principal investigator at the University Hospital Würzburg and a scientific project manager at T2 Evolve, an alliance of academic and industry leaders in cancer immunotherapy under the European Union's Innovative Medicine Initiative. Let's just take a minute to make sure your slides are working smoothly, Dr. Liu. There we go. How you can see everything in place. Let me see what this... Okay, please take it away, Dr. Liu. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks a lot for your kind introduction. And thanks, of course, to uh, to everyone who made this possible. And of course, thanks to Dr. Skowski for her incredible data and insights in, in her work today. I would like to start with a talk with the title Joint Forces, Synergizing Microbial Metabolites and T-cell Engineering for Immunotherapy. And to put some words into the front, I, I would like to start with an anecdote because um, usually people who know me for quite some time are very puzzled when I tell them that I'm working now with tumor cells and tumor immunology because I was starting my work in the mucosal immunology lab, working on the interaction between microbial metabolites, microbes, and the CD4 T cells in Lamia propria, investigating um, aspects such as the gut tolerance and inflammation. And um, this talk is supposed to show you the way I took with, within the team um, and how we, how we got to cancer immunotherapy, starting with microbial metabolites. So I, I would like to yeah, give only a short introduction as Dr. Leskowski has done that so well, but um, I, I think it's worth to mention that when we take a look at clinical trials in the context of CAR T cells and uh, CAR T cell biology, it's worth to mention that when we uh, take a look at the real number of trials, we find a lot for malignant diseases derived from the hematologic department and this is definitely not the case when we take a look at clinical trials regarding CAR T cells and solid tumors, such as for breast cancer. So there's a huge lab where, um, which we need to, to cover. And there are several roadblocks, such as finding a suitable target for a CAR T cell or an engineered T cell, such as the manufacturing process, which con consists of many steps and needs a lot of knowledge and of course, the availability of this newly produced product for patients all over the world. And one aspect I would like to take into consideration here as well is the limited efficacy we see so far for CAR T cells within the tumor microenvironment of solid tumors, which is also a hurdle for clinical translation as we are facing these issues in the research labs already. So when we compare hematologic tumors and solid tumors, we see that there are already a lot of contrast. As in hematologic tumors, CAR T cells have a very high efficacy and are very close to giving many patients the chance of surviving for a long time, getting into remission and also coming back um, 
into their normal lifestyle. So we compare a high CAR T-cell efficacy in hematologic tumors in contrast to solid tumors, which have different hurdles we need to surmount. One of these um, worth mentioning are physical barriers. So if we take the, the tumor mass into consideration, we we'll always need to take a look at, um, at, at cells which are associated with the tumor itself, such as cancer-associated fibroblasts and the extracellular matrix they provide. And these physical barriers are then inhibiting the CAR T cells from penetrating the solid tumor tissue. A second aspect I would like to mention is um, the availability of immune inhibitory soluble factors such as TGF beta, such as IL-10, so cytokines and other soluble factors which are either derived from the tumor cells themselves or from the immune cells and non-immune cells surrounding the tumor tissue. And as a third point, um, I, I've illustrated here PDL1 as one example of T-cell dysfunction or as one factor being responsible for this issue. And all of these aspects and eventually many more of which are not mentioned by me are then causing a low CAR T cell efficacy. And a few, um, a few months ago in 2020, so not too far away, um, there was a publication from uh, Margaret and colleagues in Science, and they were taking a look at checkpoint inhibition and checkpoint inhibitor therapy in combination with bacterial metabolites. And one example they have shown here is inosine from a bacterial origin produced by the Bifidobacterium pseudolungum. And interestingly, the group was able to see that when they administer inosine or inosine producing bacteria, then they see an upregulation of Th1 associated factors in the CD4 T cell department, which is based on binding of inosine to its uh, cognate receptor, upregulating the IL 12 receptor. And this effect overall is then increasing the efficacy of the checkpoint blockade, thereby reducing the tumor mass in the solid tumor model. And this is only an example of how we were also able to, um, to connect tumor immunotherapy and immunotherapy with microbial metabolites. Um, our main work was not focused on inosine, but on the short chain fatty acids, a major group of bacterial metabolites I would like to talk about during the next few minutes. And we are doing quite a huge leap forward uh, and back from immunotherapy, but to the basics of mucosal immunology. And what you see here is um, an illustration showing, on the one hand, the bacteria, the epithelial cells, and the lamia propria which we see here um, below under the epithelial barrier. And over the last couple of years, scientists have spent quite some time to understand the interaction between bacteria, epithelial cells, and immune cells. Especially short-chain fatty acids, such as acetate, propyl, and butyrate, have drawn immunologists' attention due to their important ability to either indirectly or directly impact on naive T cells and induce Treg differentiation. So the, the differentiation of regulatory T cells. And as you all know, regulatory T cells are in the gut very important to inhibit pro-inflammatory lymphocyte responses, thereby maintaining the gut homeostasis. A very fine balance between these pro-inflammatory lymphocyte reactions and regulatory mechanisms. Over the last couple of years, scientists have not only been focusing on TREG differentiation, but they were also investigating the impact of short-chain fatty acids on other immune cell and non-immune cell subsets. So for example, when we take a look at the impact on B cells, we see that also the IL-10 production and the antibody production, as well as the differentiation towards plasma cells is uh, affected by short-chain fatty acids. Macrophages are um, activated and, and are regulated in the inflammatory capacity, but also cells such as colonic, T cell, uh, colonic stem cells are affected as they are um, yeah, regulated within the proliferative capacity. One of the last subsets which was described in the context of short-chain fatty acid biology were interestingly CD8 T cells. And in viral models, like two or three years ago, was shown that short-chain fatty acids kind of influenced the memory phenotype, which was the, um, yeah, which was one of the yeah, let's say um, basic starting points for our research. Um, so what we know about short-chain fatty acids is that these small molecules are able to enter the cell, and, and while they are entering the cell, they 
um, are, for example, converted enzymatically into acetyl-CoA. And at the same time, they can induce the mTOR pathway, one of the major players in cellular metabolism. And by enhancing the mTOR pathway, they are also able to contribute to the acetyl-CoA pool within the cell. The acetyl-CoA can then enter the TCA and citrate as one of its intermediates can then be relocated into the nucleus. Interestingly, citrate can be, um, can be reconverted into acetyl-CoA where the acetyl-CoA then is used as a substrate for histone acetylation by enzymes such as its um, histone acetyltransferases. We have to keep in mind that the counterpart, which is the deacetylation mediated by HDEX or histone deacetylases, can also be inhibited by short chain fatty acids. We and other groups were able to identify that these fine balances, that these regulatory mechanisms are able to regulate the production of IL-10 or interferon gamma. And the production of interferon gamma was one of the starting points for the research we have done and for the data I'm showing you within the next few slides. To see how short chain fatty acids directly act on CD8 T cells, we started in the murine system. So we took normal black 6 mice, isolated the CD8 T cells from the spinocell fraction, and um, activated them with NT33, NTC28, and IL2 in the presence or absence of short chain fatty acids. And we analyzed them for TNF alpha, different gamma, and granzyme B, for example. And what you can see here in the bottom panel is the analysis um, of the intracellular TNF alpha and interferon gamma. Um, and when we compare the untreated cells with different charge infinity acids, we see that especially, especially butyrate and pentanoate are able to highly upregulate a double positive interferon gamma um, uh, TNF alpha population, which can also be seen in the quantification here. So, this very basic analysis that shows that the direct treatment of these CD8T cells kind of leads to, um, to a cytotoxic phenotype or to the increase of the cytotoxic phenotype of CD8T cells. And as short chain fatty acids are well known products of bacterial fermentation, um, and uh, for example, also from amino acid. Um, uh, transformation, we were asking ourselves, what is the bacterial source of pentanoate? So is there an equivalent of a strain which reduces pentanoate in the human microbiome? And what we did is, in collaboration with our fellows from Aberdeen, we did mass spec analysis of the culture supernatant of various bacterial strains. So um, during our analysis, we came across about 80 different human microbiome strains, narrowed them down, and we're analyzing them for short chain fatty acids and branch chain fatty acids, and especially for butyrate and pentanoate. And what you can see here in, in, in red, these are Megasphera massaliensis as one strain and a very close relative, Megasphera elsdenii. And these few strains were able to be identified as pentanoate producers. While butyrate is also produced by Clostridia species, uh, Megasphera was one of the unique bacteria producing pentanoate, as you can see here, which um, made us think, what is when we take the supernatant of these um, of these cultures and use them um, for culturing together with our CD8 T cells. And as you can see here, very similar to the use of the short chain fatty acids themselves, we were able to upregulate the TNF alpha uh, infra gamma double positive population within our in vitro experiments. We were wondering which mechanism might lay behind this phenotype. And from the literature and our, our own data, um, which were preliminary, we knew that HDEC inhibition might be one factor affected by the short chain fatty acids. And what we did is we took advantage of recombinant HDECs from class one and class two, covering um, a variety of these enzymes. And we treated these enzymes with the supernatant of the bacteria, looking for the activity of the HDEX of different classes. And as you can see here in red, especially HDEX from class one were strongly inhibited by the supernatant of the megasphera species. Similarly, butyrate and pentanoate were able to inhibit the same class of HDEX, telling us that the effect we see 
by treating the cells with butyrate or pentanoate might be due to specific inhibition of class 1 HDEX. So as a proof of concept, we took advantage of mozzetinostat, which is a specific class 1 inhibitor. In contrast, we used TMP195, which is a class 2 inhibitor. And what you see here is that in the middle plot, the um, frequency of the double positive TNF alpha in front gamma population was increased when treating the cells with a tenostat, but not with TMP195, which was um, kind of um, yeah, emphasizing that we might be going into the right direction and that the class one inhibition of HDX might be involved in inducing this phenotype. Unfortunately, Chachin fatty acids are acting not only on, on one pathway, but also on several other ones, such as metabolic pathways. And as I've um, described in the introduction, um, mTOR is one of the main targets, which is usually upregulated upon Chachin fatty acid treatments. So we were eager to see whether pentanoate is also inducing the mTOR pathway, as this has not been shown before in the context of CD8 T cells. And we took a look at the phosphorylation levels of mTOR and its downstream target phosphor S6. And um, as you can see here, the phosphorylation level goes up upon pentanoate treatment, um, while the treatment with mozzetinosat and TMP did not show a significant upregulation of phosphorylation level telling us that although short chain fatty acids are, um, are um, uh, HG inhibitors, not HG inhibition itself might be um, automatically increasing the metabolic impact as well. So it seems like the pentanoate, although being a specific class one inhibitor, has additional effects and additional impact on the metabolic pathways, which may play a role for in vivo studies. And talking of in vivo studies, the next step was to see whether the CD8 T cells we were treating with short chain fatty acids or with pentanoate in this case um, are more potent in in vivo setup. And what we did is we took advantage of the OT1 overwhelming system. And in this system, we use um, OT1 T cells, which are um, yeah, which have a transgenic T cell receptor targeting ovalbumin, so a xenoantigen uh, expressed by, uh, by uh, tumor cells representing the ovalbumin antigen via MHC class 1. And we inoculated or, or transplanted um, pancreatic tumor cells carrying the ovalbumin on MHC class 1 uh, subcutaneously into the mice and uh, let the tumor grow for a few days to make it palpable. And at the same time, we were generating our CD8 T cells uh, treated with pentanoate and transfer, uh, transferred these T cells into the mice accordingly. And what you can see here is that when we take a look at the group having not received any treatment, the tumor grows, while the transfer of normal OT1 T cells keeps the tumor growth in kind of an equilibrium. Interestingly, the CD8 T cells, which were pre-treated with pentanoate, completely eradicated the tumor mass, which uh, was nearly not detectable. Um, there, there, we, we could not find the tumor mass to isolate, otherwise we would have done this for, for the uh, analysis of uh, infiltrating lymphocytes. And alternatively, we took a look at the spleen and the, the priming lymph node close to the tumor inoculation. And what you can see here between the two groups, which is the untreated OT1 T cell group and the one who, um, which received pentamate pretreatment, is that there's um, um, and that there's a high presence of the treated cells, which um, carry a congenic marker, which uh, made us able to, to track these cells. Um, uh, but in contrast, the untreated cells were nearly disappeared after three days um, uh, in the mouse. And accordingly, the cell number of these pre-treated cells was much higher in the, uh, in the organs after counting. And these results were, of course, quite surprising. We were wondering, um, which might be the mechanism behind the, the presence or the survival or even the persistence of these cells. And um, additionally, we took a look at the CD8 Treg ratio. So uh, what you can see here is the, the spleen and the, and the cells from the lymph nodes um, gated on the CD3 positive cells. And uh, here we see the CD8 T cells on the y-axis and the um, FOXP3 positive cells, um, which are uh, carrying RFP as a marker. So we used um, a reporter mice for FOXP3 in this case, and this enabled us to see that there is an increase of um, 
of CD8 T cells in, contra in, in, in comparison to the T-Rex. So once we treat the CTLs with pentano-8, um, they are more present in spleen and RLNs and are also uh, kind of shifting the ratio between the CD8 T cells and the T-Rex, which is in some diseases um, used as an indicator for uh, uh, for the patient's prognosis. And um, unfortunately, we were not able to find this in the tumor tissue as there was no, no tumor tissue, but this was an interesting aspect we wanted to take a look at. And um, we, were thaw we were thinking, what are factors that prolong survival of a cell? Which, what are factors which make them more competitive? For example, more competitive uh, with respect to encountering T-Rex. And we were taking a look at C25, the alpha chain of the LT receptor, which is of course a very basic and very essential molecule for each T cell. And um, we, we did a very small kinetic. And what you can see here is the C25 expression on day one, which is um, kind of similar between cells which have not received pentanoate and those which have received pentanoate. And um, the same goes for, for day two. Um, the first contrast come on day three, when C25 is in a control group downregulated, while it stays quite upregulated in the CTL um, pentanoid group. So, um, and another facts analysis that show is that the cells treated with such infinity acids are C25 interferon gamma double positive, which kind of led us to the hint that the sensitivity for IL-2 within these very active and interferon gamma producing cells might be also increased. Um, so what we did is we used the cells and rested them for six hours uh, without IL-2 to analyze the phosphostat 5 signaling within these cells. And what you can see here in the, in the plot on the left-hand side is that um, the, the pinkish or the, the violet, depending on who you ask, um, Hive here is the group with pentanoate, and the other one here in gray is the control group having not seen pentanoate at all. And after one and two minutes of incubation with L2, there's a high, um, uh, high phosphorylation level regarding STAT5, which told us that the sensitivity and the functionality of the receptor indeed is increased, showing us that this might be one way how these cells treated with pentanoate are superior to T-Rex and might be also be able to get more IL-2 within the tumor microenvironment in the end leading to the er eradication of the tumor mass. Um, as I was talking of normal T-cells, not CAR T-cells, <laughs> we were trying to make this effect um, more visible in a translational setting and therefore we used CAR T-cells uh, which are specific for the tumor antigen row one and row one is available on first of all, tumor cells of hematologic origin, but also on various solid tumor entities coming from epithelial origin. And what we did is we took murine CD8 T cells, transduced them virally with a row one specific car, expanded them, sorted them, and uh, then treated them with pentanoate for three days. And subsequently we analyzed the T cells for very similar markers as we have done for normal non-engineered T cells. Uh, and these are, for example, C25, TNF alpha, and infra gamma. Infra gamma, so the, those markers we have taken a look at before. And as you can see here, butyrate and pentanoate are um, able to increase all of these uh, factors we were taking a look at. Um, interestingly, in a very similar setup, we used in vivo pancreatic tumor cells, which are carrying RAW1 as a target antigen, and very similar. The group having received a no treatment of pentanoid aid is able to keep the tumor mass and kind of an equilibrium, while the CAR T cells with pentanoid aid were able to provide um, a, a more protective effect against the tumor growth for a longer period of time. And uh, when we take a look at the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes here, and especially um, on the CAR T cells, we see that while the um, the TNF alpha infant gamma double positive cells uh, in the control group are, is, is, is there. It is much more pronounced in the cells having received pentanoid, showing as a reflection of the data we have shown in vitro. So uh, it seems like that the phenotype, which we were able to um, investigate in, in our first in, in vitro analysis, uh, is also very consistent 
with the cells um, or the cell phenotype in, in, in vivo, showing us that H inhibition and epigenetic modulation might play a role in manifesting such an effective or um, and efficient uh, yeah, cell function. And in the last step of our analysis, we were trying to transfer these data to the biology of human CAR T cells. And very similar to our approach in the murine system, we generated raw one CAR T cells from human origin, um, expanded them, treated them with pentano 8, and then tested them for surface markers, proliferation, and cytolytic activity. And um, yeah, as you can see here in the left and bottom corner, uh, also the uh, C25 expression is upregulated again, and we were also able to find more IL-2 um, after the pentanoid treated cells have encountered their specific antigen, telling us that the results are quite consistent to those we have seen in the murine system. And also the cytotoxic capacity of the pentanoid cells was higher in contrast to the human uh, T cells without any treatment. In summary, we were taking a look at the gut and its, yeah, let's say, and its components with regards to the cellular um, components. We were taking a look at bacteria and their metabolites and we were screening these metabolites for HGIC inhibitory activity, thereby identifying Myocera massaliensis and its metabolite pentanoate. Pentanoate was identified as a specific class one inhibitor and at the same time as an inductor of the mTOR pathway. And both pathways seem to act synergistically with regards to the expression of cytotoxic or T cell associated factors, for example, Leomis, Tibet, and different gamma. These modified cells were then analyzed for their function in vitro and in vivo. And finally, the knowledge was transferred to CAR T cell engineering, and we were um, able to see a high efficacy of the treated cells um, in both setups. So for the future, it might be able, or we, or we might be able to, to see the microbiome rather than a separate component, more as a source of bacteria and a source of little factories. And these, um, these bacteria producing many biologically active molecules could then impact on CAR T cells, engineered T cells, maybe even CAR NK cells. And once we have identified the mode of action, so which receptor they, they bind to, which enzymes they modify, and how they impact on the metabolism, we might be able to find specific signatures these substances induce. And once we have identified and understood these signatures, we might be able to improve T cell engineering. For example, getting rid of the substance or the biologically active molecule itself, rather, uh, rather putting a genetic engineered uh, cell in place, which can then be used for the transfer in the tumor setup, but also could be, uh, could be efficient in the infectious context and in inflammation or even in autoimmunity when we think of, for example, um, CAR T-Rex cells. Yeah, um, last but not least, I would like to say thank you to everyone who has contributed to the study, especially to our fellows from 4D Pharma, uh, my team from the University Hospital of Würzburg and our team leader, Professor Michel Huditschek, and also to my uh, former PhD and postdoc supervisor, Professor Alexander Verikona. I would also uh, like to raise your attention to T2 Evolve, our, um, our flagship consortium here in the EU taking care of um, or, or trying to combat the limitations of CAR T cell therapy in the EU specifically. We are um, trying to get in touch with patients, asking them for their needs. We are trying to get in touch with regulators um, in uh, improving the access of, uh, for, CAR -T, um, for CAR T cell uh, therapy to the patients. We're working on standardized models, improving current models and improving the understanding of um, of the um, of the clinical advantages of CAR T cells, and uh, yeah, last but not least, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Lu. Now, in the time we have left, let's get to our listeners' questions. So I'll start with you, Dr. Lu. Um, the meta metabolome profiling study that you carried out. How common these bacterial metabolites are that you identified 
and whether they are comparable with the diet habits or genetic makeup or any other history of the people who are used mm -hmm. for profiling. Thank you for your question. Um, you're basically heading towards a direction which is very important and might be important for the future as well. So short chain fatty acids are in general the most um, yeah, the most prominent group of bacterial metabolites. So they are um, well de detectable in the stool and in the serum of of uh, healthy uh, healthy donors of patients and everyone else. And of course, their availability has been shown to be dependent on food intake. So short chain fatty acids, such as butyrate, for example, are very much dependent on fiber rich food, on on um, food uh, which is yeah, which, which should contain be contained in our in our daily um, and our daily plan, and it has been shown that there is a um, correlation between a different inflammatory diseases uh, and short chain fatty acid production and the diet. So this is one aspect which has been um, which has been uh, done a lot of research on. Um, I think what is is now getting more into focus is how these short chain fatty acids are. In in correlation with the outcome regarding tumor cells and, and uh, tumor uh, tumorigenic diseases, so this is um, something which is yeah is still ongoing, and um, also missing for correlative studies when we take a look at um, short chain fatty acid profiles in the blood and CAR T cells. And uh, I guess this is something we we still need to work on how uh, how this behaves in the clinical context. So the I have a follow-up question to that, Dr. Liu. Yes. Would mm -hmm. you like to describe what exactly would you consider rare metabolites? So you mentioned that the pentanoid is a rare metabolite. Uh, you talked about short-chain fatty acids. Mm -hmm. um, what would be the definition? So in, in this specific case, it's quite interesting that pentanoid is produced, as I uh, described before, by Micasphera mastoliensis, and pentanoid itself is not in every uh, healthy donor and not in every person detectable as Megasphera is also not present in everyone's gut. So it seems like that among the, the samples we had, we could not detect pentanoate uh, in, in every sample because um, not in every sample we were able to detect Megasphera. But among the short-chain fatty acids, uh, Pentanoate is the one which is the rarest, which means that the concentration in the serum and in the stool of pentanoate among the class of short chain fatty acids is also the lowest among the, uh, 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 yeah, um, with um, respect to the others. So this is what I would define as rare because the, the, it's hard to detect and you can't detect it in every human being, for example. Thank you, Dr. Lu. So the next question is for Dr. Laskowski. We have an interesting oh, question I'm, here. I'm, I'm um, yes. Um, is there a possibility to use uh, iPSC to mass produce natural killer cells? And I think perhaps you can also discuss a little bit about what are some of the challenges in mass producing natural killer cells? And in fact, it is correct. There so, is the possibility of uh, of uh, there is a possibility of producing IP, uh, NK cells from iPSCs. It's work that I myself have done and others have. And uh, Fate Therapeutics is a company that's in fact moving that into clinical trials and has clinical trials actively uh, utilizing NK cells produced from iPSCs. Um, there are some challenges with that. A lot of these um, iPSC NK cells have to be validated. These are NK cells that are not matured in a human, they're matured in vitro from an in vitro differentiation process. So you have a, a number of validations that you have to do. And of course, through that process of differentiation from iPSC to NK, there are various steps, there's an, there are engineering steps that go into that process. So you do need to validate cells for any unwanted effects of the process itself, unwanted targeting, unwanted uh, editing that occurred. So a lot of that has to be taken into account. Um, so there are some challenges, and, but the advantages is that you certainly can produce, as, as the, 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 the person who asked the question pointed out, you know, massive numbers of these NK cells that can be stored for, for, for use uh, as an off-the-shelf product. Thank you, Dr. Laskowski. Um, I have another question for you. 
Um, what about cancer-associated fibroblasts? They are also part of the tumor microenvironment. Have you profiled them, and are there any characteristics that could be used for core therapy? So those are that's a great question, and yes, absolutely. The fibroblasts associated with the cancer are a big factor. Uh, they're actually companies that are built on entirely understanding and, and creating drugs that can modulate these fibroblasts and in their function. We have not particularly targeted them, but we are looking at what their effect is in the context of the tumor microenvironment. How are they contributing to the milieu that we find in there? And so, so that that's a great point that this person, it, the, 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 the um, audience member is, uh, is raising. It is an element that makes a, a big impact in the TME, and it's something that we take into consideration that we have not yet devised uh, targeting strategies ourselves, but others have. There, there, there are, are teams uh, that are looking at uh, cancer-associated fibroblasts. Thank you, Dr. Laskowski. Um, I have a question for Dr. Liu next. So you did mention that not all humans will have bacteria that will produce pentanoid. Um, so this is more of a metabolism also question. The only reason we found out that the, the discrepancy because, like, uh, Dr. Laskowski, you know, I think, uh, in will you be able to mute your microphone? Thank you. Um, Dr. Liu, can you please elaborate the metabolic functions of pentanoid? And is there any equivalent of pentanoid that might be present in the human gut, which comes from a different, meta a different bacterial strain? Oh, that's a, a very good question as well. So um, I think the the closest molecules, which which um, yeah, similar to penoid, are the other short chain fatty acids. Uh, and I guess butyrate is the most studied or the most well studied um, short chain fatty acid. And uh, when we when you think of metabolic impact or impact of butyrate on on the cellular metabolism, then there is um, First of all, um, an increase in general glycolysis um, worth mentioning, um, worth being mentioned, and also impact on a short, uh, on fatty acid oxidation, which is um, risen. So there are many different pathways which are cross-connected and uh, which are upregulated, and the ampl pathway is only one of the first steps which is involved, and uh, where many other pathways are um, depending on, and. Um, uh, if we think on the level of organs, for example, then um, it also the sodium fatty acid administration has been shown to improve, for example, um, liver function, function of um, of the uh, of the uh, cell cells there of uh, hepatocytes, and also the the metabolism of colonocytes. Um, I guess colonocytes are one of the most prime examples on on how sodium fatty acids act metabolically, as in in germ-free mice, which are devoid of sodium fatty acids and devoid of, of of bacteria, we find that the colonocytes are in a quite um, in a, in a quite inactive state metabolically speaking. So uh, once you you add either sodium fatty acid exogenously or microbes which are producing butyrate and other sodium uh, fatty acids, the um, and the metabolism of colonocytes, uh, including glycolysis and fatty, ex fatty acid oxidation, is rising. So I guess these are a few examples and, uh, on substances which are similar to pentanoid and, um, and acting on similar pathways. I hope that, that answers your question. Yes, thank you, Dr. Liu. So the next question is for Dr. Laskowski. Here is an interesting question. Do natural killer cells decrease in efficacy over time in the same way that uh, you would see for a CAR T cells? And what are the current best strategies available to either prevent or met mitigate immune cell exhaustion? That, that is a great question. And yes, uh, uh, in some instances, we do see that in K cells, uh, may weaken over time. There are ways to address that. We're studying some of those ways and interrogating some of those ways to mitigate those issues, but very similar to, to T cells. Uh, we see um, in some aspects, some similarities there. And there are similar to T cells, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with Dr. Jim Allison's discovery of anti-CTLA-4 and in, in the unleashing of the immune system full force, uh, mitigating some of the, the these um, shutdown mechanisms. 
Likewise, there are mechanisms like that that we're discovering uh, for NK cells. You know, Nichols and Tintin's group um, discovered CISH as a checkpoint for NK cells. It functions through the IL-15 axis that we know is a cytokine that's very important for NK cell development. And so likewise, uh, there are these discoveries that are emerging for NK cells and we can better modulate NK cell function. So NK cells may be weak in one instance, but by blocking some of these checkpoints in the same way that it's done for T cells, we can potentiate NK cell function longer. We can extend to that potential. But just in the same way that we know with checkpoint inhibitors, uh, you know, which we know that have revolutionized immunotherapy, you know, Dr. Allison won the Nobel Prize together with Dr. Uh, uh, Hondo for this discovery. But we know that it is not, not all tumors are gonna respond in the same way. Uh, and likewise, these checkpoints may be relevant in specific biological contexts. And so we are not just understanding that for NK cell as a global uh, biological um, aspect and function, but also how does that function change in the unique uh, TMEs for different cancers. So there might be some, some, some uh, opportunities to learn more about exhaustion in the context of individual diseases. So the way I, um, I look at it and I like to talk about it is it's more of a, a disease personalized approach. We understand the unique challenges of each cancer and try to address those unique challenges. And, and, and of course, understanding what we're working with, understanding the biology of NK cells and what we can modulate within NK cells to tackle those unique challenges within each disease. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Dr. Laskowski. So I'll ask you a follow-up question. It's, it's sort of similar to this idea. So that there's the exhaustion of these cells, you know, you have to keep them alive for a longer time. But the other idea is there's this complex tumor microenvironment and sometimes just uh, bringing these, uh, you know, immune cells into the tumor itself. So in your single cell profiling, did you come across any cell surface molecules um, that are, you know, just making these immune cells, um, you know, difficult uh, to have access to the tumor? And are there any drugs available that could be used with the therapy so that at least the immune cells, when they are present, they would be able to access the tumor microenvironment? Great question, and I think especially for, for NK cells, because this is sort of that second wave of uh, immune effector cells that are being considered for immunotherapy and for cellular therapy. We're still learning a lot of that biology, but we know that, that we've observed some, some tumors that have um, down-regulated chemokine signals. And we know chemokines are part of that signal that draws the immune system to a particular site, site of inflammation, site of a tumor and so forth. So we are looking at some of those um, opportunities. Can we um, leverage that if a tumor is down-regulating or up-regulating? How do we understand how NK cells are gonna traffic? And then um, in addition to that, understanding the mode of administration when we deliver this drug, uh, and then the, this, this cell-based drug, do you deliver directly into the tumor microenvironment as you would do, for instance, in the brain? To, you, know, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want to deliver directly into the brain. Or do you deliver this IV and, and, and rely on the cells going to the tumor? So there, there are many opportunities to tackle that challenge as well. And it, again, goes back to understanding what the tumor is doing is it down regulating some of those signals and and then back to if we understand that how then we how, how do we solve that problem and devising strategies both from the from the tumor side understanding the tumor biology but also from the the clinical you know application side can we administer this infusion this way or that way and and, and will that help the NK cells or the T cells to traffic to the tumor or to already encounter the tumor quickly so there are many ways to look at that and it is absolutely you're absolutely correct that it is one avenue that we have to focus on. Thank you, Dr. Laskowski. Um, coming back to you, Dr. Liu. So you mentioned that, you know, the metabolites are rare. And um, on the other hand, you showed these beautiful assays where these metabolites can prime different T cells. So the question, so for example, you showed there are CD8 plus T cells, there are regulatory T cells, there are naive T cells. And somehow they all could be primed or changed in a in a way that is beneficial to the immune system. Uh, so the question is: Do these metabolites have to be present in the gut lumen? Can you 
use them, you know, sort of as an uh, additional, um, you know, like a supplement or something that could be present in the blood bloodstream or somewhere in a different organ or in a bone, bone marrow, for example, to prime T cells in a way that you would want them. Thank you for your question. This is a, indeed a very essential point, um, especially when you think about how to administer new drugs or even physiological molecules which are present already. Um, I, I, I should mention again that such fatty acids have kind of a bivalent role or an ambivalent role depending on the cell type we, we look at. So if we take a look at the regulatory T cells, then we see that, for example, butyrate is known for stabilizing T-Rex and inducing um, a more uh, tolerogenic response. So um, systemic application of such fatty acids could lead to adverse effects depending on the disease context. In the inflammatory context, this um, anti-inflammatory response might be well suitable, as we know for um, colitis or even autoimmune diseases in various models. But there are also, um, uh, also studies uh, in the context of checkpoint inhibition, where the administration of such fatty acids reduces the efficacy of the checkpoint blockade due to repression of uh, dendritic cells. Um, so when we think about CAR T cells, it might be suitable as a co-therapy, but it's, it's hard to predict whether this goes, the response goes into the correct direction. And um, an, an additional point is that the availability of short chain fatty acids is always decreased in the presence of cells such as colonocytes as, as it can be used as energy source. So um, I think it indeed we we should think of um, either a victoria consortium producing short chain fatty acids or administering the short chain fatty acids, but we we should take a look at the um, the immunological surrounding on, on at the cells which are present in the tumor context as well to avoid the circ the, the negative effects. Um, but I think the direct um, inclusion of short chain fatty acids during CAR T cell engineering could be more specific. So I would not exclude that co administration will be beneficial, but I think there should be yeah be more research on doing so before we do that. But it will indeed be one perspective for future clinical trials. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Coming back to Dr. Leskowski. So you did mention one thing that these. Uh, CAR therapy drugs, they are essentially live drugs. They interact with the tumor microenvironment. <clears throat> so it might be possible that, you know, the tumor will also respond to these uh, um, new um, modified uh, cancer cells. What are some of the challenges or difficulties that you have encountered where the tumor themselves are making changes or mutating in a way that even these modified natural killer or T cells, they are not able to do their job. And the follow-up question would be, what would we learn from these new, uh, these new mutations or new antigens that occur within the tumor microenvironment that could then be used to create a new set of T and uh, natural killer cells? So that's a great question, and I think a lot of the uh, studies in the field are beginning to look at this as what we refer to as the evolution of your product, and uh, in contrasting that with the evolution of the tumor. So what's very unique about this new class of therapeutic agents called cell therapy is that, as you pointed out, these drugs, they interact with other cellular subsets that they encounter. And of course, we want them to interact with the tumor. Uh, and, and so they're subjected to uh, those elements that are part of that interaction. So it's incumbent upon us to understand what happens to the product when it does interact. And we try to uh, predict some of those interactions with our in vivo models. Uh, but a an in vivo model in an immune compromised animal, so for instance, is not the same as a human being with a disease that's heterogeneous, that varies across different people, right? There's there's inter-heterogeneity across patients as well, and there's is in as well as intra-heterogeneity, which is within the tumor itself. So understanding the differences in the evolution of these products 
and within patients is is critical. Uh, so part of uh, a lot of the work I did with the Dr. Allison's group was really to understand at the, the clinical trial level what's happening in patients, because that's the that's the truest data that you're going to get, the data from the human being that's being treated with a particular drug, and in this case, a cell therapy drug. So I think as the, the, the clinical trials emerge and more data focused on the changes that are happening in these products in humans uh, will really give us a better idea as to how the tumor evolves once it, it comes in contact with an immunotherapy cell therapy drug and how the patient uh, evolves or the, the NK cells or the T cells within the patient evolve. And so we have some studies um, that we have not yet to publish. We're, we're gearing up uh, and I think we're very poised to, to discover a lot of uh, information because we have the technology capabilities now to probe into these products at the single cell level and really understand what are driver populations, what are the populations that are driving this response? Will they expand? Are they expanding in the patients who respond to the therapy? And why did a patient to not respond to the same therapy with, you know, with the same disease diagnosis? Why are responders different from non-responders? How are they different? And I think all of this is going to, to, to be the next wave that we see in publications. And I think that uh, you know, looking at those nuances will really begin to, um, it's gonna create this iterative process where back from, from the clinical comes back to the laboratory. We learn from the clinical side, bring all that knowledge back, fine tune these therapies and put them back in the patient. And we have this back and forth until we fully understand and are able to design the right therapy for the right disease. Thank you, Dr. Leskowski. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. If you have any further questions, please consider reaching out to the speaker directly. Their email is shown on the screen. As a reminder, the webinar will be archived on the DDN website, and you will receive an email notifying you when the webinar is available on demand. On behalf of DDN, I would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Tamara Laskowski and Dr. Mike Liu, as well as our sponsor, BPS Bioscience. And of course, our thanks to you for listening. Goodbye.